Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan, and this week's co-host is Luis Elizondo Thompson. Thank you for coming back. It's good to be back. Uh, good to have you. And, and our topic this week is religion and politics. We'll talk a little bit about the Texas legislature, and we'll also talk about religion and politics nationally. And for that, we have two really exciting guests who are well informed on the subject. First, Laura Mosier, who is a journalist and f founder of Daily Action, and you can ask about that if you are interested, Louise. I am interested in all things. I know you are. <laughs> and Pastor Willie Davis, who's pastor of McGregor Palm Community Baptist Church uh, and a highly involved uh, pastor in our community on all kinds of issues. Good so that's the show today. I'm excited about it. All I right. think this is a great topic, a good issue. You know, I thought before we zoom in on Texas, we should actually pull back a little bit and talk about the sort of national perspective. NPR actually did a great job this past week of covering this debate about religious freedom. And, you know, Tom Delton reminded me that this actually used to be a bipartisan issue that where there was consensus. And that has changed. You know, Congressman Jerry Nadler, the Democrat, used to be, uh, he was one of the original co-sponsors of the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. But here we are 25 years later from that, and he feels obliged to be the co-sponsor of the Equality Act, uh, ostensibly because you know, people are being discriminated against by those who use religious freedom as the principle to justify that. Laura, what, what's going on here? I mean, we, we've, you know, this tension between um, freedom, you know, discrimination and freedom to exercise has been a, sort of a long present problem for us. But what, why is it flaring up now? What's going on in Washington and Austin that's brought us to this point? Well, I think nationally, from the highest courts to the people who, you know, to our vice president, have you, people have used this kind of canard of religious discrimination to justify, I mean, of religious freedom to justify discrimination against classes that should be protected. And states like Texas are running with it, but it is happening on um, a national level where people are saying, oh, I'm, I'm the suppressed Christian. I'm not allowed, you know, there's a war on Christmas. Nobody allows me to express myself. Actually, 80% of Americans are Christian. And the whole notion of protecting people tends to, you know, you should be in the minority. You need protections if you're in the minority more than Christians. So, um, I mean, it's been going on since, I guess the moral majority is about as old as I am, about 40 plus years old. Mm -hmm. um, that they, religion has been a very easy way to mobilize voters and to, you know, people vote when they feel wronged. And it's been a really effective get out the vote um, technique for, unfortunately, mostly one party more than the other. Pastor, you have a pretty large congregation. I mean, do you have a similar perspective or do you see this differently? Oh, I see it totally differently uh, because, I mean, to, you know, for one, uh, I've, kind of been on several issues where uh, the religious community, we've been been identified <clears throat> as the discriminators, and which uh, certainly is not the case of that. And, and certainly I think that uh, this is really almost just an opportunity. And speaking on, on uh, Congressman Nadler, after changing his mind over 25 years, I think it's absurd because, I mean, he's changed his mind on a lot of things, mm. <clears throat> but certainly this is not the case. That is not the principle of why religious liberty is important to this country. It's not because we're discriminating against anyone, and the fact of it is it's based upon philosophical belief and faith according to each one of the denomination, whatever that denomination may be. And I think that many people use it just as a political football in my personal opinion. Maybe but both sides use it as a political football. I, well, I think, I think that may be the case, you know, in the, in, as a political football. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that where in this country, <clears throat> when you, we've given the right constitutional of faith, and so, but for everybody to jump on that bandwagon, and particularly this issue on this, you know, Equality Act, I mean, I think that is totally, uh, a political method of trying to put something on the Civil Rights Act, which doesn't apply. Well, I, I want to throw up, this is a, kind of an example where religion and politics clash on, on issues, one of which is in foster care. This is a coming issue. In, in South Carolina, I believe the legislature has now passed a law that allows faith-based organizations to limit their services to those who share their faith. And uh, they had one particular example of a Christian-based foster agency that only fosters children into Christian homes. 
That's their philosophy. The legislature has passed a bill protecting that, but there are those on the other side who are saying, well, wait a minute, that's not fair, that's discrimination. Kind of the thing that we've just found that you two have talked about, kind of a clash. So in, 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 in the world you'd like to see, Laura, is there a place for agencies to specialize in who they send out children to? Privately funded private agencies, maybe, but these are always used, you know, as you say, as a political football to discriminate against LGBT families. I mean, that was really, that's the purpose of the one in Texas, you know, to say, oh, I have sincerely held religious beliefs. I don't think, I don't like LGBT people or it offends my religious sensibilities. Therefore, this child cannot be placed with this couple. We have so many children that need foster homes in this country. We have so many um, completely qualified LGBT families that are willing to take them. They should not be discriminated against because of, you know, who they love. And Pastor, it seems to me like the first principle should be really doing what's in the best interests of the child. Isn't that right? Absolutely. <clears throat> but again, excuse me. But again, I think uh, that's a that's a that's a mix mischaracterization of the church. Um, we don't oftentimes we are always accused, particularly by the LBGT, that we're discriminating against people because of their choice of uh, sexual choice. That's that's their choice. I you know I know what my philosophical beliefs are, and we we don't make it a, uh, an opportunity for church to discriminate against someone because they happen to be of a particular, um, you know, LBG, LBGT family. That That's that's not true. We, we are always labeled that way, but they, but they use the church. No other organization uh, in, across this country, for sure, that uh, gets involved in the, help to change the lives of people than the church. The church is out there. These organizations uh, particularly take one issue, and that's in the case of the adoption of a child. But what we're talking about is when things go awry, who do they run to? They use a church for every entity. Uh, what happens with the people who decides that all of a sudden, you know, they decide and we, we got Plenty of facts of the fact that people have said, I'm, I'm out of, I'm no longer in this lifestyle. I want to get out of this lifestyle. Where do they come to? The church. So I think this is a lot of mischaracterization of the church, and it's not true. We love and, and counsel and, and reach out to everyone. It's a matter of if you want to make it a political issue or whether you want to make it an issue of, uh, of a social or human battle. And so it, it's up to the individual. Well, how about like in your church? Do, do, does anyone who wants to come to your church, can they come on Sunday? Absolutely they can. Is, I, there, a, is there a test? No. We Sexual don't, orientation? No, we how don't. How about Jewish? Can I show up? You can show okay. up there. Hey, listen, just come on in there and <laughs> feel right at home. It, it's, there's, no, there's no problem with that. I have, I have members of my church uh, who have family members who are of the LBGT community. It's the gospel. We preach the gospel. And, uh, it, and so I think that uh, so often the church get accused uh, of, you know, using religion as a way to discriminate. But when That's we have so many foster children who need a happy home and a place where they're going to be loved, isn't it first and most important that we get them in a home that's going to provide that, whether it's a traditional family home with uh, a man and a woman or if it's uh, a lesbian couple or a gay couple? Well, I, I, would, I wouldn't say that that would be, in all actuality, the proper uh, way. I mean, if a person chooses to do that, uh, I mean, I know a family where you have a child, okay, and the family all of a sudden changes its dynamics, Okay, I've, I, I used to counsel with the uh, youth detention of Harris County many years ago, and, uh, and I worked with kids who were like that. All of a sudden, you have a family where it's a father and a mother, and then all of a sudden, the, the family flips. You don't put the child out. But, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that if you're trying to reach an individual on the basis of biblical principles, you don't, dis, you don't, you don't unlove the person. You, you continue to love the person, but you don't have to love what they do. And you're trying to help them out of the, the, the fact. So if you're asking, uh, would I agree that it would be uh, a perfect idea for a family to live in that kind of uh, uh, um, you know, atmosphere, I would say you know, it's people's choices. But it still doesn't remove the fact that there are some philosophical and psychological effects based upon 
uh, you know, what we believe. Well, Laura, I know one of your favorite topics is an interesting topic is, is the Chick-fil-A bill that the legislature's passed. I anticipate that it's, it was passed in the House, passed in the Senate. They're a little different bills. It's going back to the Senate. I'm, think, I'm sure they'll adopt whatever this House change. It's going to the governor. He will sign it. He so, indicated that. Yeah, yeah. so the Chick-fil-A bill, <laughs> my understanding is it prohibits government from discriminating against uh, private business uh, that uh, funds or donates to uh, act religious activities that not everybody may approve of. There's talk about micromanaging of their private donations. Mm -hmm. uh, this came about because the city council in San Antonio basically kicked Chick-fil-A off the list of approved contractors. The bill was actually t predated that by yeah, about but, two weeks. Yeah. Chick-fil-A, I mean, actually when, when we were in Austin <laughs> covering the show, when we did our Austin show, there was a protest on behalf of Chick-fil-A. They gave away free Chick-fil-A, though I didn't get a sandwich. Uh, <laughs> there, so th this bill happened because of what happened in San Antonio. Uh, and, and I can tell you, I was in the airport yesterday, or two days ago, there was a line at Chick-fil-A in the middle of the afternoon, nowhere else did I see a line. So it's a very popular product. But regardless, we passed this bill. Uh, your take on it? Is this a problem? Yeah, I mean, you can also, I want to just say, like, a church can believe whatever a church believes. We're talking about the First Amendment and the foundational principles of America, which is separation of church and state. And that's what gets muddied up in these foster care bills. Uh, yeah, call it Chick-fil-A bill, call it the bathroom bill, call it religious liberty. It is gay bashing by any other name is still gay bashing. Again, Chick-fil-A, I think, um, my child goes to a public school, Chick-fil-A underwrites every single, you know, you can't escape Chick-fil-A. They're doing fine. Third most profitable fast food chain in the country. Um, they're not this, like, again, they're not a poor, oppressed, per, you know, individual who deserves protection. Um, I think that San Antonio can, you know, that probably was an unconstitutional law that they passed telling people, but, but this law has a the kind of penumbra of this law is that it allows people who say, well, I don't like gay people. I'm a massage therapist. I don't want to go to your house. I don't want to hire you. I don't want to, you know, and you can say, oh, but I'm, I'm Christian and my religion doesn't um, like gay people, so I don't have to contract, you know, and this opens up a whole lot of, uh, scary things for LGBT people. And Dan Patrick certainly knows that, and that's why he's doing it. And I think that Chick-fil-A Chick can take care of itself. Like, they don't need the Texas legislature to be defending it. But, but people like Malaysia Booker, a transgender, a black transgender woman who was murdered in Dallas this weekend, shot in the head about a couple months after being beaten on camera. Like, transgender people get hurt because of these laws, because licensing discrimination based on no real, you know, like saying, oh, the gays are gonna, you know, kidnap my children, or like transgender people are gonna spy on me in the bathroom. All of these things, those aren't true, but they create true harm, just like anti-Semitism. It's not, it's a conspiracy theory that's not based on anything in the real world, but it leads to real world, world harm. And that's why we have to oppose these very dangerous bills like the Chick-fil-A bill. Well, is Chick-fil-A bill dangerous? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. And let me tell you something. Let me say this to that. I, you, you see, what, what, we, what we're really debating is we're talking about rights. Um, you know, in, in, in the statement you made about gay bashing, you know, uh, we, we, we talk about, the, we use these terms, uh, they created terms, you know, gay bashing. I mean, you know, uh, none of us have ever uh, in my lifetime, and, and I grew up in this city right here in Houston, Texas, and there were people who were of the uh, LBGT community, and, uh, and we didn't bash them, we didn't do that. That was not what we did. And, and, then, and then two, let me, let me just say, one of the things, that I, and I'll say this, and I'm not personally uh, to you, but <clears throat> when you made the statement about the young lady who got shot in the head, why was it the emphasis that they that you put on it that they were black? What difference does it make? Because black transgender women have a 34-year well, life expectancy in the country well, with the highest, you well, know. Well, no, no. The, though, again, those are statistics and things that have come out. Let me tell you, as an instance, I believe, based on those principles, like I was an advocate for the hero, against the hero ordinance, mm -hmm. particularly. Now, interestingly, interestingly, we have a political uh, movement going on about the attack on women. Well, it's interesting to me how the LBGT community is, is an attack on women. 
because you because the whole. Can you clarify that? Let yeah, me clarify. I'm, I'm let me clarify. Yeah. Think about it. Think about it. Who rights are being offended? Who was who was the advocate against the hero uh, that when we was pushing against the hero ordinance? Who were we? Who were who were we? Meaning when I say me, meaning the religious community, uh, other people in the community. Who were they trying to? Who were they trying to uh, to uh, protect? Women trying to protect women. The, you mean the, these women who go they, to the no, bathroom was, and get they, preyed upon? No, they, they was they okay. was trying to protect the women from men who would go in the bathroom. And understandingly, now watch it. The ordinance wasn't focused upon lesbian women going in the men's restroom. It was men going in the women's restroom. And so the the group that's generally always advocating about women's rights and women are not being treated fairly, who are the people that impose the greatest argument for the hero artist. Gay men, transgender men, transsexual men. So so that so the to accuse us of being uh gay bashers, we could basically say that LBGT are trying to take away the rights and the protection of women. We could reverse well, I'm a, it. I'm a, as a woman, I could say that I, you, you are systematically denying someone's identity. And also the reason I mentioned the black transgender woman is because that is the most vulnerable community of people in this country. And it's not helped by That's rhetoric like this saying that, oh, they're trying to, they're really men trying to prey on women in the restroom. That, that to me is rhetoric that does real world harm to people, which is why there are so many. Well, you know, no, they did say, but, but I will say to be fair that the advocates uh, for the defeat of Hero in Euston did not talk about gays or transgenders going after women. They talked about you know predators, which are criminals, and there are. There are male criminals out there who abuse women. It happens. I mean, we see it in the courthouse every yeah, day. Yeah, it's on our Supreme Court. <laughs> but I, I think your point, Laura, though, is that it's it's a it's a solution to a problem that never existed. Right. Right. And it, but but the, the solution to the problem well, that never existed actually turns into a real problem. The problem is not. Well, the problem is for the people who are getting hurt, who are getting shot. At, you know, well, the, these, the it, I believe that what? these ordinances lead to real violence against real people. Do you think that encourages violence? I think it encourages Even it's a culture the law of to murder people. Absolutely. Do I think what? Encourage? I, no, the, 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 I think th laws like this Chick Fil A law that you say think it encourages oh, the murderers to go out and find. I, I, I think that they encourage a culture of intolerance and dehumanization. For, for well, me, Pastor, and I'm, I mean, I'm interested to get your perspective on this. Mm -hmm. Some of this feels like it harkens back to not that long ago when the Bible and religious freedom was used as a justification for. Slavery. Persecution against African Americans, Latinos, uh, all kinds of different groups. And your question is what? <laughs> you don't think that there's a parallel here? No, it's not. Totally different. Totally different. Are you saying? Are you are you asking me to question that LBGT um, as a civil rights? What's the difference between wait, wait, somebody? No. Use, what's the difference between okay. somebody from 50 years ago or 10 years ago? saying that they are justified in not serving a person who is a person of color, whether they're black or brown, because it's their religious, it's their religious freedom. Because versus doing the same thing and, and applying it to the LGBT community and saying, once again, it's because of their religious freedom. But because the fact of the matter is the LBG community is trying to imply that they are a race. And the Civil Rights Act protects I've the fact. I've never heard an LGBT wait, person wait, do me, that. Well, maybe you haven't, okay, but, it's not, but that's what they're saying. That's, the, that's what they're implying. I have, let's, let's make a, if you want to compare that to me, that is, that would be very offensive to me as a black American. For you to compare the discrimination, let me finish, the yeah. discrimination you yeah. wanted, you used, you went back 50 years, so since you brought it up, let me give it to you. I've never seen LBGT people denied jobs. I've never seen LGBT people denied the riding of the front of a bus. I've never seen LGBT people castrated. They did not live in slavery and chains. So it's offensive. And matter of fact, I don't even know if on this basis, and I'm not characterized between minorities, but let me tell you, not even Hispanics and Latinos have gone through the horrificness that black Americans have went through. So for anyone, offensive to me, for anyone to compare the struggle that we went through and make that the same as it is today based on the religious belief, because you see, you got to understand something. The racism that went on as relates to black Americans 50 years ago 
was not based on biblical principle. It was based upon race. Let's make it clear. Now, did they use the Bible? Yes. But it wasn't simply based on the fact of what was in the Bible. We're going to discriminate against people. That is not true. You well, need if we're, we're going to clarify and get things right, then I think one of the things that we need to get right is that being a member of the LGBT community is not a choice. And that's something that you got wrong at the very beginning of the show. It is a choice. That's a, that's a topic for a different show. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> that we could do a, we could we do a whole show well, on that. Is it, but I is do it want though? Yeah, well, because we, we could do a whole topic. And I, want to, and I wanted to ask, because, Laura, you mentioned the First Amendment. So we're talking about going back to the founding of the country. There's been an ongoing debate in the country among uh, various scholars about the religious basis or non-religious basis for America's founding. There are some scholars who say America is totally based on Judeo-Christian principles. It's based on the Ten Commandments. This country was formed as a Judeo-Christian country. Even though we have no state church, we do have we, we do encourage religion because we have freedom of religion. Absolutely. It's one of our first ten amendments, so very important. So then on the other side, there are people who say, oh no, there, there should be a wall between the church and state. Jefferson. Yes, yeah. yes. But I think that's the only different. wall worth building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that, 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 that's kind of the, the difference of opinion there because, and, there, and the scholars, both sides can justify in the founders' writings uh, the information that justifies their position. So I'm going to let you each opine on this. So what is it? Well, yeah, I What's mean, a lot, of people, based, a lot of people came here fleeing religious persecution and a lot of, you know, people who originally settled this country voluntarily came here because of religion. Uh, and it is an argument that goes back, you know, it's not, the First Amendment can be interpreted lots of different ways. Jefferson in the letter to, letter to the Danbury Baptist said, you know, um, church and state should be separated. That is currently what we operate under the Supreme Court. I mean, I think states used to be allowed to have, you know, this state was Methodist, this state was Baptist, you know, you could have state religions and that was deemed unconstitutional. Um, and the fact is right now, again, Christians are not being persecuted in this country. Did Dan Patrick speak out when the Muslim ban was pronounced? What about when Charlottesville happened? You know, what about, you know, and again, I'm gonna defend you <laughs> because you weren't saying that, uh, you're, you're saying that people have used the Bible to say races should not intermingle. Oh, it, I'm, I sincerely believe that I should, you know, do these things that are bad. Jeff Sessions last year used Romans 13 to justify ripping mothers apart from their children at the border. Like, just because there's a Bible verse for everything doesn't mean that we can legislate it or that we should. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that it is a kind of open question, but I think a lot, most people came to America, many, many people over the centuries because it was a place where you could be free. You know, my ancestors came here because they were no longer allowed to live in Germany because of their religion. And America has always been a harbor and that's sort of the greater good of this country. It has changed a little bit, you know, again, in the last 40 years where we're trying to install sort of a theocratic layer of governing that is excluding people and that's hurting people. But I think, you know, I'm on the side of church and state should be separated. But really, is there a religious basis for the founding of America? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. It's a religious basis in the founding of America. And, uh, you know, it, 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 I'll tell you another thing that interests me because it's interesting to me that how people um, take the fact that we as Christians, because of what we believe, it's discriminatory. And uh, I think that is totally inaccurate and I think it's a I think it's a form of reverse discrimination for the simple fact to hold us responsible for what we believe. Let me tell you something. The Civil Rights Act did not give black Americans a special right. It gave us an equal right. And so when you when we, we try to make these parallels and and try to equate what went on with black Americans fifty years, a hundred years ago and whatever, you know, it, it's offensive to many of us. Maybe unbeknowing to you, but it's very offensive to many of us when people use the struggles that we have. We have a strong religious faith and belief, but I don't believe in anybody having a special right. I believe in people having an equal right. And so uh, religious, what we believe, and the Christians are coming under attack every day. So is it your position but that the civil rights yeah. was, was protected black people to the exclusion of everybody else? 
No, I said what the, the civil rights meant was it gave the equal right to everybody, whether they were black, Hispanic, Asian. It gave a right to everybody, as as was sex, because it says the equal rights of sex. So, so to imply that someone else comes along and now they want a particular special right based upon the lifestyle that they choose. I'm a black American, and, and again, I'm not gonna go down that road of the issue of choice. That's, a, that's another subject for another day. That can be another show. Yeah, that'll be another show. Week. That's next week. That's next week, okay. <laughs> but, 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 but let me just say, let me, let me, let me just say that, that people misquote the theology See, if you're gonna if you're gonna argue about what Christians do, when I heard her talk about, well, the Christians, well, first of all, you, you know, we got people out there trying to preach the gospel that they do not know, and and if you're gonna preach the gospel, and if you want to define, they'll say, oh, we can't believe that you don't love. I thought Christians are supposed to love. Well, first of all, you know, uh, give me the theology if you want to use the Bible. Give me the theology that the lifestyle that you have is acceptable. Now, Willie, uh, uh, on that note, uh, we're going to have to wrap it <laughs> Not up. Not a choice. A Not a lifestyle. Is, no, we don't oh, have wow. a choice. We don't have a choice because we're limited in time. Thank you, uh, Reverend Pastor Davis, Laura Mosier. You were uh, a lot of fun. Glad, great having you here. Both have outstanding opinions. Luis, it was a Thank pleasure you. having nice you back. Yeah, as always. Yes. Uh, and we will be back uh, with another show in another week or so.